as we take a look at the delightful book this morning. And we realize that something good is awaiting us. Let us turn to this wonderful passage of Scripture. Oh, uh, barf bags. <laughs> 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What a great Father's Day verse. What a great thing when your kids say, Why? Thy word. There's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yes, I have sworn, and I will perform it, and I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word, except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth. O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually... In my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. Brother Woodard, you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, would you please? Thank you. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The first precept or the principle that's laid out there is you've got the right guide or the right GPS system as the kids sing. You've got the right thing to give you the right direction as long as you're willing to allow it to light up your life. It's the best reading light you'll ever have. It's the best thing that will give you a time of, of light and darkness. You know, in the Bible, the Bible doesn't ever refer to lost people as unsaved people. He refers to them lost, meaning if you don't know where you're going, you're lost. You're in darkness. So you need a light, and the Bible is that light. All of us that are in here that are saved got saved because we believe the light of what's in that book. Amen. The light of the world, that's what we believe. Speaking of lights, yes, the lights are different. And uh, some people actually had to leave because it's too bright on their cataracts, or I mean on their eyes, and we'll have to see what we can do, and we'll make whatever adjustments we can. My Bible's a lot clearer, but it seems different to me. And if I come out of here and I get tan, <laughs> then we'll know y'all put in microwaves and not LEDs. But just bear with us. We're trying to make it better for the people that are watching by camera. And I don't know why they would want to see me clearer. They're supposed to be hearing clearer. But maybe it's they wanted to see all the other people. But anyway, speaking of light, it's the best reading light. It's the best heating light. And say, what does it do? It'll heat you up from the inside out. You know what I've known? I've, I've understood this for a long period of time. Whenever you get bitter and you get cold, whenever you get out of sorts with other people, generally speaking, your Bible reading curtails. Yes, you can start off reading your Bible on a regular basis, but what happens is when you start doing things you shouldn't, you can check it yourself. You start doing things you shouldn't. The one thing you seem to put down is first the Bible reading, the second's talking about the Lord. Yes. I don't know why that is, but there seems to be a toleration for other people Whenever it is you're reading the Bible, you become more tolerant of other people. But whenever it's always about what so-and-so did and who's doing this and who's going here and who's doing so-and-so. One lady said to me one time, she said, I don't have time to read the Bible. And yet she sends out over a hundred emails a day. Have time to read Facebook and have time to read the news and have time to read the newspaper and have time to read self-help books and have time to watch what's going on in the world, but not having the time to read. No wonder our hearts are so cold. And no wonder some of us come to church and there's sort of a coldness and then you wonder why does the preacher got the ice pick out or the jackhammer out trying to break the block of ice from around our hearts. 
Our hearts get cold. We're not naturally drawn to that light, that heat lamp that's in there that will heat us up from the inside out. God's interested in the inward man. A lady told me just recently, she said, I, I did what you said, preacher. And I said, what's that? She said, I read the Bible. And I said, okay, good. And I said, are you still reading it? She said, no. I said, why not? She said, I read it for 10 days in a row. And it didn't do anything for me at all. I said, okay, so you just put it down and quit reading it. Or what is your standard of measurement as to whether it did anything for you at all? I said, I think it did something for you. She said, what did it do for me? It revealed that you didn't have the character to keep reading the Bible unless you got something out of it. Most of us approach the Bible and we say, God, give me an answer. God, give me an answer. We put the Bible down, spin it, open it up, stick our finger down and say, God, where's the answer? The Bible's not written to always give you a specific answer. It gives you general principles. It doesn't always tell you exactly things to do. It may not say, don't smoke, don't drink, don't dance, but it will talk about some things in general that says it's not good for your testimony. It will say that if your fellowship is right with the Lord, you have a desire for the things of the Lord. But too often our character gets tried and we say, well, Lord, I read my Bible, but it didn't do anything for me. What if it pleases Him? Here's a novel idea. Suppose your church attendance has never been about you in the first place. Suppose your church attendance is just to please Him. Would you continue to come? Suppose you came and never got anything. Just saying. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we have a tendency to get cold-hearted and get consumed with what everybody else is doing. It's a great nightlight. When you're in darkness, it'll give you light and give you the right direction to get out. I'm just getting this out of the way before we get going. It's a good safety light. It'll keep you from stumbling. One of the greatest lights you have in your house, if you don't know the way to the bathroom, especially when you get old, is a night light. You say, why? Because you don't want to stub your toe. And you don't want to fall down. Sometimes we need a light at night. Sometimes we need direction at night. Sometimes when things get hard and get dark, you need a little beacon there, a lighthouse, that'll give you the direction that you need that's so that you know you're moving in the right direction. What are you doing? I'm just going toward the light. Listen, when the, the wise men were following the star, they followed the light they had. They didn't know where it was eventually going to come to rest. They simply followed the light that they had, but they did follow the light. And might I say this, the light was on at night. Amen. I don't know, I've never really heard anybody preach on it, but it almost looks like they're sleeping and camping during the day and wait for the stars to come out at night so they'd know what direction to move in. All right. Amen. Maybe there's something good because the Bible says that we're not as the others that are drunk in the night, but we're children of the light. And maybe if we would look hard enough, we could find direction in the dark hour in which we live. But we're not supposed to be looking to the Constitution of the United States. I'm not going there again. We're not supposed to be looking at the legal system. We're not supposed to be looking at the social system. We're supposed to be looking at the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. And too often what happens is we measure our happiness by what the world says happy is. Well, I'll show you in just a minute. Our happiness is not based on what everybody else says it is. It has to do with us doing what God wants us to do. It's a good light to have when you're traveling. It gives you the proper direction. It shows you. In verse number 106, he makes a promise. He says, listen, I've sworn and I will perform it. I will keep thy righteous judgments. Would you agree? Easier said than done. Too often, look in Psalms chapter number 1. Too often, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that we do is we think that when it comes to guidance that it's one of those things that is left up to question. God gave you a race to run, but if you're going to follow God, you won't get to run it the way you want to run it. One of the ways you know you're out of the will of God is, is you can't take orders from anybody. You don't recognize any authority. You're the boss of everything. And you have a tendency not to like anybody that challenges you. Or might steal your light. One of the things that that points out is, is you're running your own race. The Apostle Paul says, I run the race to win the crown and I fight in order to win. He says, I'm doing these things to be pleasing to the Lord. I keep my body in subjection, but I do it with a purpose in mind. And that purpose is to please Him. Is that why you're running the race you're running? Psalms chapter number 1. Let's take a look at this real quickly and then we'll move on. Psalms chapter number 1. He guides our steps but He also guides our stops. 
He guides our steps. But He also guides our stops. Some of you need to stop. Some of you need to stop and your, your sins are not smoking and drinking and cussing and dancing like you used to do. When you loved everybody and were wicked as the devil and immoral as the devil himself, now you're saved and born again, but you've got a mean spirit about you. Some of you need to stop this morning and consider other people. Sometimes you get so consumed in what you want to do, you know what begins to happen. You quit letting God guide you at all, and you just forget about everything except whatever your goal or your objective is. That ain't God at all. That's you. Amen. Psalms chapter number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standeth in the way of sinner, sitteth in the seat of the scorn, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. Why? Because he's following what God wants him to do. And sometimes it's like, Lord, don't bother me with the instructions. I already know where I'm going. I already know what I'm supposed to do. And hey, I've been doing it so long, I don't need to be told what to do anymore. Take your Bible quickly and come to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm not for trying to tell everybody what to do. But the Lord does guide your steps, but He guides your stops. Stops is a good way of leadership. Kaylee breaks out of the bunch when she was littler than she is now. She's got a little brains now. But she breaks out over there and Joshua <laughs> hollers and says, Hey! Don't run across that street! Say, well, he shouldn't yell at her and, you know, he shouldn't be talking to his daughter like that in public and he probably embarrassed her and why didn't he come up there? First of all, it ain't your daughter. Amen. Second of all, she don't know enough yet at that time to know whether or not running out in that street is going to get her killed. And third of all, the stop was in her best interest. You say, well, we should just let her just do what she wants. She's got liberty, you know. She's born in the United States of America. She ought to just be able to make her own decisions. I know people raising their kids that way right now. They don't discipline them. They don't, they, amen, don't get all jacked up. I told you it was going to be this morning. They don't discipline them. They coddle them. They care. They're like, oh, well, we can't do nothing to them. They're perfect little angels. No, they're not. They're born devils. You do not have to instruct them how to do wrong. It comes in the package. You have to instruct them how to do what's right. And unfortunately, they control you instead of you control them because, hey, you become an expert. And so what happens is, is instead of understanding that there is a point in time where you have to tell others and God has to tell us, stop That's right. Amen. the bad attitude. Amen. Stop the arrogant spirit. Stop the inconsiderate, selfish way. Stop your foolishness. Stop being lazy. Amen. But what happens is when we get told stop, it's like, be telling me to stop. Oh, man, I'm... We'll fight. I got liberty. In the church, when you try to ask people to stop, you're looking for a throwdown. You ought to just be glad I'm here. I remember a fellow nailing this piece of base over here. We replaced it. And I walked in the door and we were putting this piece of base on and he's got a big old nail. I don't know how big it was, but it's too big to go in there. Big old huge nail, big old hammer, and he's getting ready to drive it in there. And I said, hey, brother, I said, appreciate your help and all, but can I ask you a favor? I said, why don't you get that little finishing nail gun and, and come over here. He threw that hammer down. He said, it's free labor if you don't like it. I said, look, man, I'm just suggesting to you that it's a piece of wood. And, you know, I, I happen to know a little bit about stuff and it's too big for the wood. You're going to split it? Well, you know what he did? He drove it in there anyway and split it. And the next thing you know, he split. You say, what'd you do about it? Well, we took that out and cut it and used it up here somewhere with a shorter piece. We cut the part that he split out. But that's just a perfect illustration. It's free help. And because it's free help, nobody's supposed to have any direction or any guidance or hey, because it becomes all about you, about your ministry, about what you're doing. And you can't, nobody can mess with you. If you do, you're going to throw down and get mad and get upset because somebody said, hey, could you do me a favor and park in the back? We got this. Because, oh, hey, I've been coming here 20 years. Amen. Am I preaching now or what? If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. I'm trying to make room for you because you ain't the one going to be offended. It's them cotton-picking, mossy-back, jack-leg. I've made up my mind. I've been here.
here forever and I ain't changing and I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I'm like a tree planted by the water. You ain't a moving me. You've taken ownership of God's church. You can no longer be instructed. Can't be taught anything. Can't be shown anything. And somebody just went <laughs> up with the umbrella. Well, I'm glad so and so's here. And I hope she's hearing this. My God, I wish that one was here. This sermon is for her. It's for you. You talk about taking hard preaching, and some of you have been around here 20 years, but then when it's just a thing, hey, could you help us out with so-and-so? Huh. Everybody else can do that, but I'm an alumni. <laughs> I, I've been here for a long time. Rules don't apply to me. Did you just hear that? What did you notice? You notice a silence. Because some of you old mossy backs just said, yeah, that's right. They all for the new people. They ain't for me. The Bible is given to us to give us direction. The church is supposed to be a place of order. And it becomes quickly a place of disorder when those that have become accustomed to the routine can no longer be given instruction by God or anybody else for that matter. I just always done it like this. You never said nothing before. Times they are changing. You might have to sit upstairs every now and then to let the visitors sit down. Amen. 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 You might have to crowd down a little bit toward the front so they can come in in the back. Hey, they're not as spiritual as you. You've been here 20 years and you're sitting in the back. When you first came here, you wouldn't come sit down up. Or you ain't like Jerry. I told Jerry this morning, I said, Butter, you're in the spit zone. He goes, that's where I want to be. I said, man, you're crazy. I, you know what's strange, though? The longer you've been here, further back you move. Used to be a day where you wanted to be up here with the girls. What happened? Oh, well, now preacher things has changed. So now we say, could you do us a favor and maybe slide up here? Because when the visitors come, they'd rather slide back. I ain't sitting up. This is my pew. I've been sitting here. I was here when this thing was built. My pew. We, we, you couldn't move over let nobody... No, nah, uh, let them go on the balcony. Let them sit on the floor. Let them get a chair. Amen. Say, what are you talking This is just old-fashioned, slobber-slinging, old-school preaching. We need a tune-up. You take your car in for an oil change and a tune-up, you need an oil change and a tune-up. The light got dim and the lamp done blowed out from some of you. Those smudges are all over the panes of the windows. You can't even see the light anymore. You're letting your light shine before the whole world, not His light. That boy, we can't wait to get bigger and see more people. And now it's like, well, we big enough now. We, they're going to actually make me move out of my seat. And one fellow said... Well, if i got to move, I'll just find somewhere else to go. Wow! Why are we here in the first place? I don't understand that. It's like, hey, if i got to, if I got to be inconvenienced, well, help me, Jesus. We're just getting started in Hebrews chapter 12. Aren't you glad you came today? We all need to think about this. Every one of us. And if you're applying it this morning to somebody else, it's for you. I know somebody that's that way. Yep, me too. I look at him every day in the mirror. I realize who got this thing preached to him first. I say, well, Lord, I'm going to do so-and-so. The Lord said, did you want to run that by me? No, I got it. I'm, I'm good. I know what we're going to do. You want to check me on that? Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, no, they're not watching you from heaven. That sure wouldn't be heaven. That'd be hell. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run away the patience, with patience, with patience, with patience, the race that is set before us. Can I say this about running that race with patience? He says, run the race that's with patience that's set before you. Run in your own cotton-picking lane. Not, not you to worry about what everybody else is doing and how they're doing it. 
One of the quickest ways to know that you're not, well, the lamp's not a light to your feet and a, light, a, la a lamp to your feet and a light to your path is you're shining it on somebody else's light, uh, path. I just think they ought to be, I just feel like he ought to say, I just think they ought to do, I just feel like this. Well, I know what the rule says, but you don't understand me. I'm special, special circumstances. Now, I'm going to get real close to the cotton. You ready? You don't apply that when it comes out there to the police or they'll write you a ticket or put you behind in jail. You do not apply that at the movie theater or at Walmart. You do not apply that at the restaurant. But bless God, you expect everybody to run the church how you think it ought to be run when you come to church. Help me somebody. Well, that's different. Really? Why is that different? Why do you not apply it in your business? Why don't you apply it at school? But when it comes here, everybody's a special case. We're going to follow the Bible or not? Decently and in order. Are you causing chaos or not? I'm causing chaos. Fine. I'll just leave. Wow. Go to the restaurant. Please wait over here to be seated. You ain't going to seek me now. I'll just leave. Okay. As you can see, we got plenty of people waiting to take your place, so don't matter to me. Walk into Walmart and the old person don't greet you. In the they didn't greet me when I come in the door. See if I got, okay, we'll go somewhere else and buy your toilet paper. They ain't worried about that. But in church, can I get a hallelujah? It's a little different. We think everybody ought to make us somebody. Them rules don't apply to me. Hebrews chapter number 12, I'll just say this about this. He says, you've got to be looking in the right place. Verse number 2. To the author and finisher. Of, uh, uh, you say, why? Because when you're looking at everybody else, you ain't going to finish right. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. He guides our steps. He guides our stops. He guides our steps. He guides our stops. And if you came in today, you wouldn't expect this maybe in most churches on a Sunday morning. Uh, but uh, I believe that's what I'm supposed to be doing is just preach what the Lord would have me to preach. You say, well, you're just saying that. That's just to try to keep us from saying anything. TK was following me around after Sunday school. He's walking around behind me like this. He's got his hand under his coat, you know. I turned around and said, hey, brother, how you doing? Happy Father's Day. He said, yes, sir. Walking around like that. I said, brother, what in the world? He said, I didn't want anybody to whoop you. After what you said in Sunday school, I figured if I walked around you, I said they wouldn't mess with you. <laughs> I said, okay, good, stay close. <laughs> but but now, that's a strange thing. We want you to be welcome. We're glad that you're here. But you know what we have to do sometimes? We have to realize we claim to say we're going to do what the Bible says. We are in the second verse there in Psalms number, uh, whatever that was, 106 right there, or 100 and, uh, yeah, 106 right there, where we swear that we're going to do what the Bible says. And yet, when the Lord says, you're the guilty one, it's like, but you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand my situation. Y'all going to do things like I think you ought to do them. You teach my kid like I think you ought to teach him, I'm taking him out. I guess I must be real close to the taters. Or... See, this is a little too practical. Let's get more spiritual. This is spiritual. Because you're not stopping to think about your impact on other people. Because you're a spiritual brat. You just ought to be, I just won't come anymore. See? That's what the babies say. You give me what I want or I'll cry. You know what that is? Our kids learn manipulation at an early age. You know how? They squall until you pick them up. I got a dog like that. When we get older, we get that way. And my dog was young and he wasn't so messed up and that kind of a thing. You know, I was like, I didn't care. Now he comes up and he can't hear nothing. And he keeps barking until you give him something. <laughs> And he drives me insane. You can say something to him. He don't hear you anyhow. He's like, he's like a Baptist. <laughs> Amen. You can sit there and say, shut up. And he's like, woo, woo. You know, and I'm like, hey, be quiet. And he's like, woo, woo. I ain't going to be quiet until you give me what I want. And you can't hit him or nothing. He's too old. You'll break him. I mean, he takes forever to get up. And he's kind of wobbling around, you know. And when he comes up the stairs, he's like, one. I'll be there in a little while. 
unless daddy wants to come give me a ride. <laughs> Two. It's like, Lord God, you are worse than a Baptist. Get moving. <laughs> Do you know what he does? Now he's got me trained. He don't go to her. He goes to me at dinner time. Now my father-in-law's there for the last couple of days till he gets well. And he's kind of been playing on him a little bit. But I can't say nothing. Because he's got me hook, line, and sinker. He looks down there like, I'm old, I'm going to die soon. You wouldn't want to have this on your conscience, you know. That I was just asking for a little crumb from under the table. And you wouldn't even give it to me, and even though I'm a representative of you as a Gentile dog, I'm like, here, here, here! Oh, that's good. That's good. Manipulates the squat out of me! That's what babies do. They keep squalling until they get what they want. Amen. They ain't stupid. We'll ask you, smartest in the world, why do they do that? Because they got you manipulated. Yeah. Hallelujah. Has anybody ever experienced that before at all? Anybody? One, two, three. Thank you. Only three. You're liars. Not me, preacher. My kids don't manipulate me. Yeah, okay, boys. I'll talk about them daughters, okay? And them granddaughters, okay? Them boys don't manipulate you. But don't you tell me them girls don't. You don't know yet. You don't need to know for a long time. Ain't no hurry. Mama said, Hallelujah! <laughs> Spiritual manipulation in the house of God. I don't want God telling me what to do. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I'm going to get my way or I ain't coming. Right? But Lord, I promise, I swear, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Get right! Now, Lord, you must be talking to somebody else. One of the quickest ways to know you're out of the will of God is you have a hard time with ordained authority. Amen. Psalms, or uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Now you can see why there's opposition. Every man that striveth, verse number 25, for the mastery is temperate in all things, balanced. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. And I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I keep my body, excuse me, un and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He doesn't lose his salvation. You know what he says? He says there's a principle in line, and that principle involves two things. Number one, I've got to keep myself in line. And number two, I've got to be careful who I hang out with. Amen. If you run with somebody who has a limp, you will never reach your full potential, and before long... You'll be limping. Amen. Amen. That's good. And the problem is, is we're no longer paying attention to who we're around. When you start looking around you, you might find yourself. Because we generally gravitate to people that are like us. We're supposed to be like Him. But the body of Christ is starting to limp a lot. You say, why? We're running with the wrong crowd anymore. It happens inside the church. Have you ever noticed that? Somebody gets upset and gets bothered, gets mad. They always seem to gravitate. It happens at camp. I know that. Right. You can ask Brother Sam. We have to camp with another church. It's a real good church. And they come in there and our bad one will find their bad one like that within 15 minutes of the buses pulling up on the parking lot. <laughs> it's like, wow. It's like... And they don't have this, oh, hi, how are you? Oh, nice to see you. They're like buds immediately. Like kindred spirit, they're off and running. And it's like, uh, hey, brother, I need to talk to you. Yeah, well, that one right there, you might kind of want to watch. Oh, well, I was going to come to you, preacher, and tell you that one right there, you might kind of want to watch. And I said, isn't it interesting they're together? We've been doing this thing over 20 years now. You know what I found? I found that same thing happens in the church. Amen. You have a tendency to gravitate toward people. Nowadays, you're able to do it covertly. You gravitate to them on the... Internet, Psalms 119, quickly. It gets better. I like to get the bad stuff out of the way first. Amen. I don't like to eat dessert first. Because there's nothing that, to me, ruins dessert worse than having your apple pie and then having broccoli. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Having ice cream and magic shell and then Brussels sprouts and spinach and green beans. 
or even salad. Uh-uh, let me have all that, get it out of the way, now I'm going to enjoy my meal. <laughs> Dessert. So we get this out of the way first, you get your broccoli down, and then we'll move on. Hope it's helping you. 106, I have sworn I will perform it, I will keep thy righteous judgment. I'm telling you, he makes a promise to follow the way. But you know what? He says, no matter what, Lord, I'm going to do it. Most of us make that promise in situations of duress. Israel said, whatever the Lord says, we'll do it. Do you realize it was less than 30 days after they said that, they were worshiping a golden calf? Lord, if, if the Lord says it, we are in, lock tight, we're down, we're good, let's do it. Peace, love, brotherhood, we good. <laughs> Within less than 30 days, they're worshiping a golden calf. I've told you before the illustration several times. The roofer sliding off a roof, man. He's getting ready. Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll be in church Sunday. I'll read my Bible. I'll study. I'll pray. I'll give. I'll do everything. I confess every sin. I know to confess. I'm going to fall. It's going to hurt so bad. I hope I don't die. Lord, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And about that time, his britches catch that nail that hadn't been hammered down yet and grabs him and stops him. And he turns around like most Christians and says, Never mind, Lord, the nail caught me. We usually make those promises. But we're quick to forget those promises. But if you made a wedding vow that way, somebody would say something about you. If you made a promissory note to the bank for your house or your car, they'd come get your house or your car. But we take it that we can make a promise to the Lord, and well, it's just a promise to the Lord, it don't really matter. I promise, Lord, I swear I'll do anything you want me to do. How many times have you made that promise when your hind end is in a vice? You are messed up, man. You are in trouble. God, I will do anything. Just please do so and so. And one of two things. Either number one, everything turns out okay. It's like, eh, the nail caught me. Or number two, it didn't turn out like you intended for it to turn out. And because your manipulation didn't work and you weren't as important to God as you thought you were and He let go ahead happen what was going to happen, you just said, fine, I'll show you and checked out on God. I've seen many a person promise God all kind of things after they've killed somebody or raped somebody or robbed somebody and they promise God all kind of things and they wind up in prison and never have nothing to do with God. You say, why are they doing it? They're saying, God, I'm so important. I'll turn my life over to you if you just get me out of this mess when they don't realize maybe the best thing for them in that mess is to wind up in jail. Yeah. Say, jail couldn't be good. I guess you know better, but sometimes it is good. Amen. Within 107, I am afflicted very much. Let me talk about this for just a second, if I could, please. The afflictions don't stop just because you're doing right. That's right. That's right. That's right. The afflictions come from outside... And they come from inside. Now, I mean to let you off the hook. I love you. And sometimes all of us, anytime, the preacher, the preacher's wife, the Sunday school teachers, the choir leaders, the pianists, the organists, the orchestrators, the ushers, the, the nursery workers, we can all be a pain in a rahunkus at some point in time. <laughs> Nobody's excluded. Amen. Sometimes we can be a pain in somebody else's neck. The problem comes when somebody says, you are being a pain in the neck. And instead of us saying, you know what, I'm sorry, let me fix that, because I didn't want to be, because I know how it feels when somebody is a pain in the neck, and I don't want to be that pain in your neck. We usually get mad. But don't make a mistake that just because you're right with God and at that time you're not being a pain to everybody. Everybody has bad days. Everybody gets whacked out. Everybody does stupid stuff. Some things you can overlook for a while. Some things you've got to tighten up. I have one fellow that I know. He'll come in and say, all right, preacher, give it to me. I ain't got 15 minutes. I'll say, okay, man. I can get more done with him in 15 minutes than I can with most people in five, five days of counseling. Now, he don't always like it, but he'll go, okay, all right, okay, and then he'll walk out. Sometimes his hind end a little high on his shoulders, <laughs> but he's like, okay, all right, fine, and he'll fix it. That's character. That's character. But you know what happens here in this passage? This fellow here says, Lord, I'm afflicted. Right now, I'm doing the best I can, but in spite of me doing the best I can, it's no guarantee that the affliction's not going to come. 
two places afflictions come from. They come from inside and they come from outside. They come from enemies and friends on the outside, but they can also come from inside. Sometimes it can come from our perspective of how things ought to be. Sometimes what we think is things should be different than they are. And so we get mad because of something we've dreamed up in our mind. And the next thing you know, it becomes a reality to us. And we're convinced, no matter what, somebody is just doing me wrong because I just know they're just doing me wrong. I'm just positive that they're doing me wrong. Sometimes depression, and it's a very real thing. And it comes at you from the inside. You say, what do you do? Well, here he goes to the Lord and says, I know I got problems. And he says, quicken thou me. That means I'm close to death. That means revive me. That means help me. That means do something for me I can't do myself. That's like a fellow that's down here and he can't breathe and all that. And he's looking at you and he's saying, breathe for me. That's what he's saying. Quicken thou me. Make me alive. Bring me back to life. This thing, as they used to say, it's killing me. This old black lady I used to know, when you get around there, she had problems with her kids. I don't remember how many she had, but she had a bunch of grandkids and stuff, and she was always trying to take care of everybody. She made the best chicken rice and, and uh, uh, turnip greens you ever had, you ever tasted in your mouth. And go in there, and Grandma, she'd make something, and we'd sit down there for a while, and she'd say, you know, my children, they hurt me to my heart. They hurt me to my heart. She said, it don't hurt me on the inside. She said, it hurts me in my heart. It hurts me in my heart. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I know one day you're going to come knock on my door and tell me one of them dead. I know one day you're going to come knock on my door and tell me you're going to have to put one of them in jail. She said, I want you to know my heart hurts. Inside hurts. Sometimes that inside hurts and there's only an outward manifestation, but that inside hurt is a real thing. And it really does hurt. And whether you would be hurt that way or not, maybe God just been gracious to you for you not to be hurt to your heart like that on the inside. He says, hey, listen, I've been hurt so bad. There's such a deep wound here, Lord. I need some help getting over this. That's where our pride kicks in. That's where we say, hey, nobody can see it. A young lady said to me, I said, hey, sis, how you doing? She said, good on the outside. Oh my. I said, confirmation. You say, why? She's hurting on the inside. Right. Went to my office and prayed and said, Lord, please don't let nobody get in front of her today. Don't let nobody say something stupid to her today. You say, why? On the outside, she's good. But on the inside, she's as fragile as a newborn chick. And the wrong move in the wrong direction. And she could break all the pieces. She's tender right now and she's very touchy right now and she's very frightened right now. But on the outside, hey, I'm good. But man, on the inside, I'm hurt. And pride says, nobody else knows. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm good. The psalmist says, help me, quicken me. This is killing me. Hurt me down deep. In a place that only you know about. A place sometimes that we can be hurt so bad, ladies and gentlemen, that only God can put the bomb of Gilead on it to be able to help it. He says, I've been afflicted very much. And he says, quicken me according to thy word. Get into something a little bit positive right here. Notice the persecution picks up. It shows up again in verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me. Sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's your own self. Sometimes we beat ourselves up over unnecessary things. Sometimes we have a level of expectation of ourselves of being something that we're not capable of being. And we fall short because we think, people think, if I don't reach that level, what will they think of me? Maybe they're not as consumed with you as you are. And maybe that's the devil pushing you into the wrong perspective. Look, if you will, please, in the passage right here, not only that persecution comes, sometimes by those closest to you. Isn't that the ones that hurt the most? When somebody, I mean, Sam doesn't do all, uh, excuse me, Brother Sam no, uh, didn't intend to be rude, but Brother Sam sometimes, he sends me these email things. And we get a bunch of them and people that have heard things. And some of them are pretty nasty. And I told him, I said, look, I'd rather you just not send them because all it does is upset me and I, they're not in my church anyway, and I don't, I, I mean, I get one of them things, I'm liable to just say, you can turn the whole cotton picking thing off and change the lights back out for all I care. They can find us with a flashlight. I'm, I'm being honest. 
say, well, this is ministering to people and it's reaching people. I know, but I'm just telling you, I got to have a little buffer in between there because when I start, you know, all them people are saying all those things and then the next thing you know, your doctrine's opened up and this is opened up and they're wanting to ask you 500 million questions and get you into a run and gun battle with their pastor and all this other stuff. I Really, I'm telling you, I got to pray in between my wife and Brother Sam keeping that off of me. And I got a good bunch of fellows that are around me with my deacons and trustees and keeping it. But, but the temptation is, is, you know what? Turn it off. Don't even make a CD. If you're here, great. If you're not here, oh well. I realize the time we live in. But it's hard. It gets difficult. And sometimes those people send something in. And yeah, it hurts. But it wouldn't hurt as much as if you did it. Wouldn't hurt as much as if you did it. You say, why? You're my family. Amen. You say, you got a blood family. I do. Blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You're my family. Amen. There's some people that can hurt you, but those in your family, they have the ability to really hurt you. Sting. Persecute you like no other persecution. The Lord Himself said, what are the wounds that I've received in the house of my Friends. You know what he says to Judas when Judas comes and kisses him? He says, what are you doing here? Friend? You say you're my friend? Can you get this thing out of my back? I can't quite reach it here. I, what, what is that, man? What are you doing? And sometimes it hurts. So what do we do when that happens? Because it's something that's going to happen. I wish I could tell you. And I wish I could warn people to tell them, don't do this. It does hurt. But it won't change the fact they're still going to do it. There's some of you today that will walk out after I have said what I have and you will still set in motion what you planned to do before you ever got here. And you will think that this is for somebody else. And you will still hurt people in your family. Amen. Amen. You know the passage this morning in 1 Corinthians 11? Talking about not discerning the Lord's body. Not talking about the corpse. The Lord's body, where we're one, unified together. Your attendance matters. Your encouragement of your Sunday school teachers and your nursery workers matters. Yes, you not running contrary to how everybody else does things matter. Even little things. The lady put some nice stuff there in the thing. She put some car stuff and all that in the bathrooms. I kind of thought it was pretty cool. The lady came to me and she said, I want to know who put all that car stuff up there. I said, my wife, she goes, oh, well, I guess I can't say nothing then. I said, well, no, you can say whatever you want to say. She goes, I don't think it's appropriate for church. I said, you're right. We don't have it in the sanctuary. We have it in the bathroom. She said, you're always talking about all that racing and all them cars and all that other stuff. And I said... Well, there's another bathroom in there that's dressed up for little princesses. Why don't you go in that one? I can lay it down when I have to. And sometimes I, I know I'm nice in the pulpit and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but when somebody just keeps doing that stuff, did you, you, what, what's behind that? Why would, why would somebody care if you've got an a oil can up there and a Chevrolet up there and a... Oh, you want us to put a Ford up there and make sure we'll put a BMW and a Mercedes. We'll get make sure all the car companies are represented equally. <laughs> but you know what she didn't think about? She didn't think about somebody who was out there Christmas time shopping and thinking, man, it would be kind of cool to do something different in the bathrooms and That's right. That's maybe right. we could do something to kind of dress it up. And you know what? The little kids are the ones that go in there all the time. Yeah. That's the Sunday school building, and that's where the nursery workers take the kids. You know, when the kids are sitting there, you know, and they're kind of like waiting for things, you know. Amen. Did you ever stop to think there is a seat within a seat there? They didn't have those when I was around. Your dad either held you or you fell in. I learned this move quick at church. You put your arms on either side of the seat and held yourself up or you fell in. Amen! Don't act so stiff. 
Say how that, I don't know, somebody thinking about somebody beside their self, but this individual, oh, she just didn't like Ford or Chevrolet or something. I don't know. Just looking for something to say, I don't like that. Go to the other one. Close that door. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Abomination. Abomination. Okay. But she never stopped to think. You say, what'd you do right out of there? Until just now, I never said a word to her. You say, why? Oh, what a hurt her. What she didn't know was the lady that said that was at the top of her prayer list. And she'd been praying for that lady for a long time about a particular issue that this lady had asked her to pray about. You say, what would happen? It would hurt. Isn't that what happens? It hurts. What do I do? Quicken me according to thy word. So here comes the good part. You better know the word in times like that. You better have those exceedingly great and precious promises to overcome that. I can do all things, but strengtheneth me. How? Through Christ that strengtheneth me. I can all things work together for good to them that love God, them that are called according to His purpose. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings of eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hey, you better know some precious promises. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You ever stop to think about that? That at a time like that where hurt and pain comes in and there's no answer, the Lord, as He says in the passage, the, the Holy Spirit being the one that inspired the actual author, the writer of the psalm says, Lord, quicken me how according to Thy Word those promises matter. And I realize that we should obey the principles. And I know we should go by the precepts. But sometimes it's those precious promises that give us the power to tell us what we ought to do and then comfort us like nothing else can. What's that song? Standing on the promises of Christ my Lord. Standing on the promises. In times like that, you know what you need? You need that promise of eternity. You need to know that He's sealed you to the day of redemption. You need to know that He's got everything working together for your good. He's got your best interest at heart. He doesn't guarantee you'll be insulated from it. But He said, I have an answer for it. And it's found in the pages of the book. He said, behold, I come in the volume of a book. Let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. When's the last time when you were hurt that you turned to Him and said, Quicken me according to Thy Word, instead of turning to somebody else's Word? Instead of turning to another person that can only give you superficial comfort because you don't know what angle they're coming from. And believe it or not, guess what? They may not come from the angle you think they might. They may think that you're very bad in what you're doing. They may think you're wrong in what you're doing. They may lie to you and tell you what you want to hear and then go cause trouble in and of themselves. Look, if you will, back in Psalms 119. He begins to kind of come out at the Bible will hush your fears and hinder your foes. The Bible will hush your fears and hinder your foes. I have a little picture in my mind I saw a long time ago. We were walking through an antique place. I don't know why. Buy it new. If it's already old, it's going to fall apart sooner. We're walking through an antique place. <clears throat> and I saw this picture of this old woman holding this little baby. And it was obvious the little baby had been hurt. Tears were dried on their face and you could tell just in your mind, you could make up that little baby's probably pulling that. <laughs> you know, kind of how they do that when they're hurt. And it's pitiful, and that little lip shaking and quivering at the bottom, you know. <laughs> like that. And the caption on the bottom of the picture was, Hush now. Hush now. Hush now. 
That Bible will have you hush up with your fears. Yeah. Not to stifle your cries, but to give you comfort when you're crying. It's in the Bible. Good. That's where he tells them to turn to. You say, what else? It gladdens our heart because of the promise he makes for the future. You know what he says? He says, I'm with you even to the end. I'll never leave you and never forsake you. Is that what he said? You ever read Romans chapter number 8? Who shall separate us from the love of God? And angels and things to come and things that have gone and devils and principalities and, and the things in the high and the things in the low and all that. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Once you're in Christ, you can't be separated. You ever read those promises? But have you ever thought about this? He says, unto the end. Have you ever thought about your final destination? Brother Ray, sometimes I get so consumed with the here and now. I forget this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Amen. I get, Miss Sharon, so consumed with my trouble. And it may not be nothing compared to your trouble, but to me it's a lot of trouble sometimes. I get so consumed with that. I get so caught up in that. I get so worried about that. I forget, wait, wait a minute, man. I'm, I'm probably within 20 years or less of kicking out of here. Where I'm going is what should be my focal point, not what I'm in. Sometimes I get to thinking the decisions that are being made are, oh, they must be eternal. And it's like, okay, well, guess what? We'll get past it and we'll get on with it, but how's it going to affect eternity? And sometimes, Brother Brad, the here and now has more impact on me than the hereafter. I get worried about it. I call you on the phone and go, his computer is not working. And I've got papers to grade, and I'm getting behind, I'm off schedule, and I've got places to go and people to see. I'm so important. <laughs> Brother Brad, preacher, I can be right there. No, I don't need you to come over here. I don't want you to do that. I'll call Lance. <laughs> Lance, this computer's not working. Preacher, I'm in Tallahassee, but when I get back, no, I don't need you to come over. I want you to fix it now, over the phone. Because it's so important that it has now consumed my day. I can't do my banking. And it's so overwhelming that the bank is going to miss their money so much that I really need to get in there. That's okay. <laughs> I can't grade the papers. Okay. That big of a deal? Amen. But sometimes, yes, sir. something so minor Amen. can become so yeah. major. Yep. Right. I was at a church one time. I got done preaching. I thought I preached pretty good, but I'm prejudiced. I, I'm usually pretty honest about myself. If I get in the car and I go, how was that, honey? She knows. You already know how it was or you wouldn't be asking me. You're looking for sympathy, attaboy, is what you're looking for. She's one of them. She'll give you an attaboy if there's an attaboy. She ain't going to just give you one for nothing. And if you got to ask her, she'll, well, oh, that was, you know, is a... <laughs> she's been around a lot of preaching. She knows. Amen. So what does she know about it? She's been listening to me for a long time. I was preaching long before I was preaching in the pulpit. She was my congregation of one. <laughs> she knows preaching. I'll get in the car with her and talk to her about that. Well, I'm finished with preaching, and I thought I did pretty good. People come to the altar, some people came up and said, it's a blessing. One guy came up to me and said something that was just downright mean. I mean, just mean. Now you got to understand, preachers, they're doing the best they can. Really, we're not perfect. I'm, honestly, well, you know that by now, right? <laughs> but, but, but we're just doing the best we can. We don't, we don't hit it out of the ballpark all the time. Probably not even 90% of the time. Maybe every now and then it's like... <sighs> but the rest of the time it's just like, you know, saltine crackers and water. It's like, okay, well, uh, we got something to eat. It wasn't very tasty, but, you know, I had pablum like that when I was a baby. But, you know, thank you for trying. Just keep trying. But I got done and he came up and man, he said some just, just rude, mean. 
And the first thing I thought was, well, I said some pretty rough things when I was preaching, so I guess I probably deserved that, and he's probably mad. And the next thing you know, I thought, well, you know, kind of who does he think he is? And the next thing you know, I'm consumed with what that one guy said in spite of what everybody else said. That one guy dragged me down like a lion would drag down an antelope and had me down in the dirt because of what one person said. I was licking my wounds. I was back in the back of the old preacher's house and he walked back there and he said, hey, brother, the preacher's doing a good job. Let's go eat. And I said, I'll be there in a little while. He said, what's the matter with you? I said, nothing. He goes, when he gives you that look, it's like, I'm not going to ask you again. So you either tell me now or I'm done with you, you know, kind of thing. And I said, oh, well, this fellow said so-and-so. And he said, okay, well, good, praise the Lord. He said, you know, friends last you a little while, but it going good enemy will last you for a lifetime. So you made a good enemy, let's go. <laughs> Felt a little better, but not much. I'm sitting there at the table and all that kind of stuff. And he leaned over, he said, listen here, brother. He said, that's a, a good thing. He said, it'd kind of keep you down where you need to be. But he said, the second thing is, you need to realize that you can't ever focus on the good or the bad and make more out of it than Jesus. He said, half the people that told you did good were just being nice. And the other half, they maybe really did get a blessing in spite of you. And that guy, you may have tripped his trigger and gotten him upset about something. I, I said, well, yeah, but it hurts. And he goes, yeah, well, don't be focusing on it sure. in either direction. He said, you're a preacher. And you talk the way you do and the way I talk. He said, you're going to make some people mad. He said, God will probably call that guy to preach. <laughs> I said, over my dead body. <laughs> I didn't say anything, but I thought about that. And I thought about how often we allow one person opinion to get us so focused on what's going on down here Amen. that we forget about the person Amen. up there Amen. where the walls of jasper are and the streets of gold Amen. and the gates of pearl yeah. where there's angels and cherubim and seraphim and no sin Amen. Amen. where the Lord is perfect and we're perfect and Everything is done away with and no more worry. And, and I'm going to be there forever as we were singing. Mm -hmm. That's right. Miss Nancy just sang forever. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. And we get to thinking that whatever's going on in that 20 or 30 minutes or maybe even 20 or 30 years has now somehow trumped eternity. You know what he says? Until the end. Forever. The last thing we got to learn to do is, is we got to learn to focus on perfection and not on people. Amen. People can hurt you. Can't they? Amen. People you have expectations of, they hurt. But people are not perfect. So for me, what I've had to work on all week is when something happened, and it has happened in buckets this week. I've had to go, but they're not perfect yet. But he is. Amen. Amen. And I have to keep turning and looking, not at the place, looking at the person. So you know what I see in Psalms 119, verses 105, to the end of that stanza right there? Noon, as it's called in Hebrew, not that it's anything special. We would say none. It's the number for 50. It's the word for 50. It means fish, like Jonah uh, being a fish, that's be like that passage right there. But you know what I see in that passage? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Where's that path headed, David? Are you going around and around your own personal problems? Are you using the Bible to light your own way? To find your own direction? To just stay locked in down here? Or is the path that you're on focusing on the person? And I'm moving closer and closer to Him. No longer is it about me, it's about my relationship with Him. And no longer is it about all the other people around me, it's about Him. Because if my relationship is right with Him, my relationship will be right with other people. There's no way my relationship will be right with other people if it's not right with Him. 
If you're here today and you're lost, I'd say this to you. You're lost according to the Bible. You're in darkness. You need a way out. And the Bible says, and it's a promise, that if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, He'll save you. That's what the Bible says. He makes you that promise. He said, if you come unto Him, He'll in no wise cast you out. That's a promise. He said He'll save you. When will He save you? Right now. But I dare say that a big portion of you here today are most likely saved. You know He won't cast you out. But your focus is not on the path that's leading to the person. Your focus is on the people that are on the way and blocking your path. I'd ask you this morning, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe you might stop and think for just a minute this morning, you know what, Lord, I, <laughs> I have gotten my eyes off of you. I've gotten my eyes on me. So-and-so let me down. So-and-so hurt me. I got problems. Lord, I, I need my heart turned back in the right direction, back to You. Not just the beauty, the wonder, the splendor of heaven, but I need it turned back to You, the person. Too many people are in the way, myself being one, Lord, help me. Even the little ones, you get your feelings hurt. You just got out of school, your friends were going to call, they haven't. They said something harsh or rough or mean about you, on the computer. Your feelings are hurt. That's real. Hey, even in church, maybe somebody here has hurt you. Maybe I have hurt you. Not intentionally, mind you. But maybe your focus is more on that than it is on Him. God spoke to you. Maybe you come up and you cry out with the psalmist this morning, Lord, I already know, as if it's a a known fact. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and light of my path. Lord, I swore to you, I promised you, I was going to do right. And Lord, now that you've pointed out to me where the problem is, I need to keep that promise. I'm